Thank you very much uh, for giving us an opportunity to present the Journal Club today. I'm Dr. Maxwell Boachi. I'm the Chief of Spinal Neurosurgery at the University of Louisville. Uh, the presentation will be made by our outstanding uh, residents and fellows. Uh, there will be four presentations. We selected some fairly recent um, interesting articles in the spine peer-reviewed literature, and we hope to have a good discussion. Uh, the presentation, the first presentation is by doc Dr. Nikhil Jain, our current spine fellow, who is going to be looking for a job uh, later this year. And our ex-fellow, Dr. Fabian Caballo Madrigal, who uh, we just hired because he's so excellent and outstanding. Uh, Dr. Mayor uh, Schammer is uh, also a former fellow who is also now a neurosurgery resident at PGY-5 and Dr. Mina Tarikunti, who is our current chief resident in neurosurgery. Uh, so let's get started. Dr. Jane would we'll start with the first presentation. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Bhaji. Um, I'm going to start presentation one of four. Um, this is a, published in the, the Spine Journal earlier this year. Um, so from Kyunghee University from South Korea, minimally invasive multi-level lateral lumbar interbody fusion with posterior column osteotomy compared with radical subtraction osteotomy for adult spinal deformity. Um, brief introduction, we know three column osteotomies are powerful techniques for deformity correction. However, there's a high risk of complications. Accordingly, there have been growing interest in MIS techniques and especially the anterior column realignment, which essentially is an ALL resection and using of hyperlordotic cages for deformity correction. The authors of this study um, state that the current evidence for ACR and uh, MIS techniques is limited from uh, small patient cohorts. There's heterogeneous surgical techniques, fusion levels, and ambiguity in results of how much correction you can get. Um, so the objective of their, their study was to use consistent surgical techniques and equipment and actually study radiological and clinical outcomes um, in two comparative groups, uh, multi-level OLIF with PCO uh, versus a traditional PSO. So to do this, they report a retrospective comparative cohort study between 2013 and 17 the single institution, single surgeon series, inclusion criteria, patients more than 65 years of age with standard clinical and radiological um, diagnoses of, um, or indicators of positive sagittal balance, um, had a minimum follow-up of two years, and either underwent a multi-level OLIF with PCO or an open PSO. The consistency was in the levels of fixation that everybody got a T10 to pelvis. Um, some techniques, uh, procedures, a procedural specification, the multi-level OLIF group got a 12 degree peak gauge at, um, at the levels. They don't, however, mention if there was static or expandable. They don't mention the height um, of gauges or whether they use lateral plate fixation. Um, they use BMP and allograft for graft. Uh, they specifically say it was without ALL release, so it's not an ACR technique. Um, at the 5-1, they, they said that they did a OLIF whenever it's possible with a 12 or 15 degree cage, um, but had to do posterior antibodies in elderly or where there was a high risk of OLIF or could not approach it. Um, they did a PCOs, posterior column osteotomies in all OLIF levels. However, they don't state what grade, if it was grade one or grade two osteotomy. Um, they used a cobalt chromium rod um, with a flexible attachment at the top UIV, which it looks like this, and they, they have described it um, before in their series. Um, in terms of PSO, majority 63 out of 65 were done at L2, um, used autograft and B, uh, DBM, um, again, cobalt chromium rods, um, and they state they used a four rod fixation, but do not state if it was accessory or satellite rod fixation. Um, in total, they included 106 patients, 65 in the PSO, 41 in the OLIF group, give very limited demographic and clinical variables, um, not, not a lot of difference in terms of age and gender, more osteopenia in the OLIF group, but not statistically significant. Um, these are radiological outcomes, um, which they compared, um, quickly going over them. So pelvic incidence, um, 55 comparable, uh, average 55 comparable amongst the groups, pelvic tilt given as SVA. So the main point here is that these patients have a really high SVA of 
preoperative, about 20 centimeters in both groups, and they were able to correct fast neutral in both groups to actually negative, um, to like a centimeter, um, which kind of stayed at the last follow-up of about neutral to five millimeters positive. So that's really aggressive correction. Thoracic kyphosis restored after um, their correction techniques. Um, thoracolumbar junction angle was significantly higher, corrected higher in the um, PSO group because the PSO was located at the L2. Um, lumbar lordosis, again, neutral to five degrees pre-op, um, that is kyphosis, and they corrected past 70 degrees, almost 70 degrees um, with, with their techniques both in both groups comparable, which kind of stayed or maintained at follow-up. Um, in terms of operative variables, again, limited um, results, uh, no difference in total op operative time between the groups. Um, there was a 1.1, average 1.1 liter more blood loss in the PSO group as compared to the OLIP group. Um, again, limited outcomes, VAS, leg and back, ODI, both comparable, uh, significantly improved, both comparable between the groups. In terms of complications, um, neurological complications, there was only one in each group, the transient L4 palsy in the OLIP group, and a neurological complication on post of day three in the PSO, but they don't state what complication However, they say it recovered after revision surgery. PJK rate, um, again, they said it was more than 10 degrees definition. PJK angle in, uh, increase over pre-op, but they don't state what UIV they used for calculation. Again, 26% in PSO, 22% in the OLEV group. In terms of pseudoarthrosis, um, again, significantly higher in the PSO group, but they don't state how, how, um, the pseudoarthrosis. Uh, they say it includes rod breakage, but don't specify the actual numbers of rod breakage or how many revision surgeries were done for pseudoarthrosis or PJK. Um, in the OLIF group, average three levels per patient, average correction per level was about 18, and majority were done from L2 to L5. Um, they got CT scans in all patients post-op, and in actually eight of these 16 levels, eight, 16 levels, uh, they got more than 30 degrees correction um, and eight of them actually had more than 40 degrees correction, um, which they acknowledged in the discussion was due to ALL rupture from forced posterior compression. Um, this is one case example they gave in a 71-year-old female multi-level OLIF with the CT scan on the lower left showing more than 30 degrees correction and the fish mouth appearance, which they got from forceful posterior compression and ALL rupture in this patient. And this patient looks like she had a previous surgery before um, in conclusion, the authors state that the multi-level OLIF with PCO using a stiff rod is an effective alternative to three-column osteotomy with a lower bleeding and complication profile, neurological complication profile. Some of the strengths of the study, it's a relatively large sample given the nature of the cohort, more than 65 years of age, very severe spinal deformity. Um, they use a uniform surgical technique with a single surgeon. Um, it's the kind of first study to show an OLIF without ALL release and PCO kind of a hybrid, um, but not ACR, to show similar correction comparable to PSO for severe ASD. Um, it's a good follow-up, two to four years, and they give details of segmental correction in the OLEP group. But a lot of limitations. At first, it's retrospective. It's limited generalizability due to the cohort and the population and being a single surgeon. Uh, they give limited description of the clinical profile, whether it was primary versus revision surgeries, flexibility of the deformity and other functional deformity-specific uh, patient-reported outcomes. Um, they give PI and LL separately, but do not dis describe the distribution of PI LL values. Um, they do not mention the grades and levels of PCO in the OLIF patient, uh, not mention how many rod fractures were in the pseudoarthrosis group, and how many underwent revision surgery for PJK or pseudoarthrosis or rod fractures. They don't have results to support their conclusion that there was a lower com neurological complication profile in OLIF because there was only one in each. Um, the details are not completely given. And it's also unclear how they managed 70 degrees lumbar lordosis correction with a single level PCO, PSO. Um, they don't give if their uh, details, if any, any other techniques were performed. And more of a comment, um, the rate of PJK seems comparable less than reported in literature for their supraphysiological correction of sagittal parameters. Um, a couple of points to start off the discussion for this study is they report a multi-level OLF without ALL release in severe ASD, which kind of contradicts what the recommendation for class three and class four 
of the MISDEF2 definition is where they recommend ACR or at least open or hybrid um, techniques. And then what are the biomechanics and implications of having more than 20, sometimes 30, 40 degree correction with a 12 degree gauge anteriorly? And also a comment on the forceful ALL rupture with posterior short, uh, with forceful posterior um, shortening over the rod. Um, thank you for listening. Yeah, Nikhil, uh, thanks uh, for an excellent uh, presentation. I, um, I do realize you covered most of the limitations of the paper. However, you know, um, let's assume the results stand, that they did get the results, and there's no reason to doubt that they got that. Uh, it would mean a very significant um, uh, alternative treatment of these spinal deformities, uh, one that has not sufficiently been described in the literature. So I think um, it, it suddenly is very um, tantalizing findings that needs to be uh, confirmed in additional studies. But if it is true, uh, this really provides a significant alternative way to treat uh, some of these without doing the um, more risky uh, PSOs. Um, as you know, the treatment of these is either through the ACR or the posterior approaches or combined approaches, but uh, we haven't seen much in the literature in the way of uh, just doing the, uh, the PCOs in combination with that. So I think this is significant. Uh, I was very impressed by their uh, complication profile for the multi-level OLIPS, but overall it looks very, very interesting. And we, with that, we will open it up to uh, any, any questions. So this is Jens Chapman in Seattle. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. great. Uh, good morning. And Louisville and Nikhil, thank you for a, a very nice and critical discussion. Uh, as somebody who is uh, engaged in a lot of reviews of scientific articles, when I see a complication profile of less than 1% uh, presented in uh, deformity surgery, I have to admit that my suspicion titer rises. Um, uh, and uh, the devil may be in the detail, the BMIs, and I think, Nikhil, I, I really want to endorse how critically and thoughtful your uh, discussion was. Uh, now, assuming uh, with Dr. Boacci uh, that uh, this was all very uh, honestly reported, uh, there's a lot of details to, to discuss in there, uh, such as um, whether the authors went from the concave or the convex side, how bad these deformities truly were beyond the uh, uh, overall profile. So um, I think that um, this, is, this is something where I think it's important uh, that we have alternatives to the uh, dogma of PSO, but I'm uh, kind of loath to have the new dogma emerge that we have to have some minimally invasive anterior procedure. So um, did they present complications beyond neurologic complications like ureter injuries and, uh, and other the myriads of things, cage subsidence after one year, things like that, Nikhil? No, so the only complications, three in each group, um, apart, one, one, one each neurological, and apart from that, the non-neurological or non-spinal was a hip fracture on ambulation, a, um, um, a hemothorax, um, and then a superficial wound infection, but none of the kidney ureter, visceral, vascular, um, no comments on subsidence. Um, uh, yeah, so none of that was um, described in the results. So, so yeah, that, that, that's for me an important uh, factor. Uh, Izzy, are you online? I don't see Izzy right now. But yeah, it, um, again, just for me, uh, we have a very large deformity practice here, and some of my partners really like multi level OLIFs, and uh, we have a very good access surgeon. But uh, what I see is uh, there's, there's morbidity with anterior procedures. This is not a benign little uh, factor. And of course, it's very nice to restore height and alignment of the anterior column by rebuilding these collapsed discs. But uh, yet again, there are many, many uh, details in there uh, that I didn't see in this article. So thanks for that discussion, though. Uh, uh, Jens, a quick question. Uh, were you surprised by the amount of correction they could get from a single level PSO, oh, it's almost 70 degree co correction? Uh, yeah, oh, thank you for bringing that up. So that's a, that's a super physiologic level <laughs> of correction. Yeah. Uh, I, the older I get, the less I like PSOs. We, it, we, I used to do them a lot, and we nowadays, uh, as you probably know, do these intradiscal osteotomies. 
um, far more. And again, when you do that kind of a correction, you actually get dural buckling and you can get secondary uh, significant uh, arachnoiditis sometimes. So, so this is something that I view with some suspicion. And again, the closer you look, the more you see problems emerging and the closer you follow your patients long term, the more issues arise. So uh, these are big surgeries. These are complex decision making things. And thanks for pointing that out, Maxwell. This is, this is not a trivial number there and certainly, again, raises eyebrows. Any other questions? If not, we'll move to the next one. I, I do think the results are interesting and needs to be confirmed in, in more studies. Um, next uh, will be a presentation by Dr. Fabian Corvallo Madrigal. Uh, Fabian, I think you may be mute. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Can you morning, hear me? Fabian. We, yeah, we can hear you, Fabian. Good, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. So I'm gonna present to you this paper. It was published uh, in the beginning of this year. Uh, it's called the Factors Predictive HS and Segment Disease After Lumbar Spinal Fusion. The author is uh, Dr. Georges Maracas and co-authors. And so the rationale is uh, we know that lumbar spinal fusion is a common surgical procedure and can be obtained through multiple uh, surgical approaches and techniques. Uh, we can do a lifts, we can do uh, lateral lumbar fusions, we can do posterior spinal fusions, and we have T-lifts, we have plates, we have uh, posterior lateral fusions. So the fused, the fused segments get immobilized and this is compensated by an increase in the adjacent segment motion. So a common consequence is secondary degeneration of the adjacent segment reported as high as 30% in the, in, the next few year, in the next five years. So multiple studies have attempted to elucidate the factors that contribute to, a, to adjacent segment disease with no consistent results. So the primary goal the primary goal of this paper was to identify patient-related re and surgical technique uh, risk factors for ASD occurrence needing reoperation. So it was a retrospective revision of all patients' uh, electronic medical records who underwent a spinal fusion for spondylo. It could be for spondylolisthesis, it could be for stenosis or uh, tunar disc disease or lumbar disc herniation. It was done in just one uh, single center uh, from 2006 to 2017. Oh, that was not me. <laughs> so the exclusion criteria were non-instrumented fusions, uh, fusions of the entire lumbar spine, thoracic lumbar and pelvic fusions, less than six months of follow-up data, uh, non-degenerative pathology, or iliac instrumentation. The primary outcome was uh, the development of surgical ASD, defined as symptomatic progression of DDD one or two levels above or below the previous fusion. So these are the results. Uh, they obtained a cohort of 568 patients. Uh, most of them had a diagnosis of uh, spondylolisthesis and stenosis. Uh, most uh, procedures performed that were single level fusions and two level fusions. Uh, we can see the mean age of the cohort was 55 years. Uh, most patients were female, 21% were smokers. Most, patient, most patients underwent a posterior spinal posterior lateral fusion or an ALF plus a posterior lateral fusion. Uh, most patients also had a laminectomy and they found a an incidence of 29% in the surgical uh, ASD and with a mean time of 3.5 years. So this is the second table. Uh, factors associated with a higher risk, higher rate of ASD was the use of allograft, uh, decompression outside the fusion construct, laminotomy, discectomy. And when they did the regression, they found that um, the multivariate regression, they found that the only factor associated with a higher risk of ASD was decompression beyond the fusion construct. Mm -hmm. So the authors um, 
make the discussion that positive findings are in this paper are the large cohort with higher statistical power. Um, they found that different fusion surgical techniques have similar uh, incidence of ASD. Uh, a higher rate of ASD uh, was found where cases um, requ required uh, surgical decompression outside the fusion construct. So they, they made the comment that there was a clear surgical effect on ASD incidence. Limitations of this study, it is a retrospective study. Uh, there's a selection bias. Uh, the, the authors reported uh, missing patients, uh, missing data sometimes, missing information, non-uniform imaging, uh, global, the alignment, the overall alignment was not taken into consideration. Uh, also, the clinical condition of the patient was not mentioned, was not taken into account. The, all the spondylolisthesis cases were not classified according to the etiology. <clears throat> to the etiology. Uh, Pre-op MRI findings were not taken into account. There is no description of the surgical techniques. If there was, any, if there were any facet injuries, if there were any um, complications, um, there is no um, report or or description of how the uh, spinal decompression was done through aggressive laminectomy or. Or if there was removal of the posterior ligamentous complex, other observations. Uh, I think this is important. They reported a short time from surgery to reoperation. Uh, the authors also reported that spondylolisthesis was actually protected, could protect the spine from ASD. So is that true? And also, when you read the paper and you find that, and you read that um, some patients received a fusion instrumentation for spinal stenosis, so. As a surgeon, they think there might be there might be something else in the clinical scenario in the clinical picture of the patient that that convinced you to proceed with such such a an aggressive 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 tr treatment. So the take home message is for me is that the surgical decompression beyond the, from this paper is surgical decompression beyond the fusion cluster might increase the risk of ASD in the future. Thank you. Um, you're actually muted. You have to be careful. Um, the compressing levels that are not included in a fusion. Um, this uh, surprising to me. There, there is a number of surgeons that still do that. Uh, decompress the level uh, maybe above. Uh, the internal fusion levels uh, where there's maybe some mild moderate changes and they'll do a little laminotomy or decompression there. Uh, this paper seems to suggest that that increases the rates of adjacent segment uh, distribution. Um, obviously, this is a topic that's poorly understood, but this uh, paper, I think, adds uh, some additional confirmation of, of that. And with that, I'll, I would leave, uh, I would open, uh, open it up for questions. Thank you for this um, uh, very interesting topic again. Um, Maxwell, I'll, I'll direct that to you uh, first. Um, and that is, um, I saw that uh, statement by the authors and again, the devil's in the detail, just like in the last paper. I must confess, I do a lot of decompressions uh, above fusions that I perform. And again, I would not be doing that. This is an anecdotal medicine statement, by the way. Um, if this was going to fall apart very significantly. So the devil in the detail a point that I'm trying to make here is if you do a full laminectomy above a fusion in the lumbar spine in an active patient, I have little to no doubt that this will fall apart pretty rapidly. If you do a selective microscopically aided decompression with midline sparing where the PLC stays intact and do a partial careful facetectomy, uh, that risk is far lower. So that's that's the surgical technical point. The constitutional point is a significant also uh, uh, one, and that is connective tissue health. So people who have, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis, who are on steroids, who have just um, uh, inflammatory diseases in general, they are at a far higher risk of connective, sort of adjacent segment failures than the stout, plump male with kind of a collapsed 
this pattern of spondylotic general spine architecture where segmental instability does not become a major burden. So two part uh, question to you that Maxwell and team. Uh, number one, is every decompression above a fusion the same or are there ways that we can uh, ameliorate that risk? And number two, are there differences in terms of uh, uh, adjacent segment disease that we have not really looked at carefully enough in our literature? Thanks. Yeah, um, personally, I try not to do decompressions above. Um, I'm not familiar with, um, it sounds like your experience is that if you're careful about how much decompression you do, it may help. I generally don't do it. There is a paper, another paper that came out, I think last year, that uh, said that it also depends on the level. Like they studied the ASD and they found there were more ASD at the L5S1 level if you did a little bit of anatomy or decompression there. And they actually recommended that even if there is a little bit of degenerative disc changes uh, that are asymptomatic, that you leave the level alone if it is L5S1. Um, you know, but my practice has generally been to try to be very careful about doing any type of decompression uh, above about refusion. Are there any, any other comments? Uh, there's one comment from Mark Dekutowski to all the panelists. Uh, it says facet, oh, I, I think I like, let me see if I can. Yeah, it facet. says facet de denervation and direct facet capsule destruction varies substantially by surgeon and case. MIS tissue sparing decompression can be conducted without accelerated degeneration. And I think this piggybacks on Jen C your point uh, is, yeah, maybe you can do it, but just be careful about uh, maybe uh, sparing the posterior ligamentous complex and, and being uh, judicious about uh, how much uh, facet removal you do. But, but in general, I have to say, again, the adjacent segment disease uh, question can be answered with a simple number. Uh, following a fusion in the thoracolumbar lumbar spine, the rate of adjacent segment disease is about 100%. It's not 60, it's not 30%. The longer you follow up patients, the closer you look, uh, the more expansive your radiographic definition is, the more this equates to 100%. And it's just a matter of how bad is it going to be? And do we have to actually treat it surgically or can it somehow be ameliorated by changing some of the patient's habits? That's, for me, the, the main take-home message of adjacent segment disease. What do you think, Max? You're muted. Uh, yes, yes, I'm in agreement with, with that, yeah. It, 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 it's bound to happen if you follow long enough. Uh, some of them would need surgery, others would not. But I think the point of this article is just be careful about doing uh, the, the decompression. If you're going to do it, just um, don't do a full-blown laminectomy and, and expect that it would be okay over a long term. All right, if no further questions, we'll go on to the next talk by Dr. Mayor Shamer. Thank you, Dr. Boyachi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm one of the residents at uh, Louisville, uh, University of Louisville. Um, I'll be presenting this uh, article pre uh, published in Spine Journal uh, recently. Should thoracolumbar junction be always be avoided as UIV uh, in long instrumented fusion in patients with uh, adult spinal deformity? This paper was, uh, uh, this work was done at Samsung Medical Center from uh, South Korea. So let me see. This. Sorry, I can't. Um, sorry, I don't have control here. I'm not able to move this. Okay, here we go. All right. Uh, so proximal junction failure following long instrumented fusion for ASD is a well-recognized complication that has negative impact on outcomes. Older age, uh, uh, osteoporosis, comorbidities, higher BMI, uh, great preoperative uh, uh, sagittal imbalance, larger correction of deformity, and UIV at TL junction has known to be the uh, risk factors in the literature. Uh, upper instrumented vertebra between T11 to L1 is associated with development of PJK uh, and PJF, uh, as mentioned in the literature in multiple studies. 
and in patients with adult spinal deformity, since majority of deformity happens at lumbar spine, uh, the, the, that's the region where majority of uh, deformity components are situated and located, and that's why TL junction is uh, involved in a uh, lot of operative cases. And UIV level should be set with neutral and stable vertebra to maintain sagittal balance and uh, thereby reduce the need for revision, as uh, mentioned in the literature. So based on this background, uh, the authors aim to investigate the risk factor for proximal junction failure after long instrumented fusion in this patient population and uh, <clears throat> without increasing the risk of PJF. So this is a single institution uh, retrospective study uh, span over a long period of time from 2005 to 2016. The inclusion criteria were uh, patients more than 50 years of age uh, with adult spinal deformity and UIV at TLJ uh, from, then that's uh, they define as T11, 12 and one. Sacral fusions of the lower, lowest uh, 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 instrumented vertebra with or without ILEC fixation. Authors have mentioned that after 2011, they have started doing ILEC fixation in uh, patients who require more than four levels of fusion to prevent 5-1 uh, non-union. And uh, minimum follow-up required was two years. Exclusion criteria was patients with ankylosing spondylitis and those with post-operative infections. All patients underwent uh, pedicle screw instrumentation and titanium rod. Uh, they didn't specify uh, uh, other details of the surgical procedure. I mean, osteotomies or uh, uh, other type of uh, maneuver if they did uh, to prevent UIV. Um, in terms of radiographic measurements, they look at uh, different parameters like pelvic incidence, sacral slope. Uh, pelvic tilt and uh, uh, our standard uh, parameters. Uh, PJF was defined as post-operative proximal junctional angle of greater than 20 degrees at any time during follow-up or vertebral fracture at UIV or UIV plus one, failure of UIV fixation, or this leading to myelopathy or need for proximal extension of fusion. And that's how they define their endpoint. Um, uh, they studied different variables, which they categorized as patient fa factors like age, gender, osteoporosis, BMI, smoking, and ASA grade. Surgical factors like UIV level, 11, 12, or 1. Uh, previous spine surgery, surgical approaches, uh, posterior, anterior, or combined, PSO, and ILEC fixation. Uh, radiographic factors, uh, uh, they looked at various parameters we looked at, and they considered a completeness of optimal correction if PI minus LL was within 10 degrees. And they also looked at outcomes during follow-up using uh, SRS-22, uh, which they assessed pre-operative and at last follow-up, and uh, ODI. Uh, they used standard statistical analysis uh, uh, to look for uh, any correlation. So in terms of results, uh, approximately 35% of patients developed proximal junction failure. They had total cohort of 63 patients and 23 developed proximal junctional failure. The only factors which they found to be, oops, sorry, uh, which they found to be relevant uh, on univariate analysis was age. Uh, patients in proximal junction failure group were slightly older. They were around 69 years compared to 65 years. Um, and 95% uh, of uh, uh, patients in uh, PJF group were females. And uh, the other thing they found uh, relevant was osteoporosis uh, 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 rates were higher in the PJF group. Interestingly, uh, uh, the instrumented level, the uh, T11, 12, or 1, were not, in, uh, were not different, as well as the surgical approaches were uh, not found to be statistically different. Similarly, PSO and ILF fixation were not different among the cohorts. Um, in terms of uh, radiological risk factors, uh, uh, they identified uh, they, they basically looked at preoperative parameters, postoperative, and the uh, delta, a change in parameters after the surgery. So uh, uh, in terms of preoperative parameters, they found preoperative pelvic tilt, PI minus LL, and uh, proximal junction uh, angle being significant, uh, significantly different among the cohorts. Uh, SVA was uh, not statistically significant, but as you see, it was seven centimeter here and was just off, to, uh, off the normal 54 millimeter here in the non-PJF group. None of the post-operative parameters were found to be significantly different among the cohorts. Um, and a, a change in parameters were also not different. So as you see, uh, the SVA was kind of uh, uh, within normal range here. All right, so based on this uh, univariate analysis, they put the factors in a multivariate model and they found three factors which were found to be relevant, which was age, more than 70 years of age, osteoporosis, and 
preoperative proximal junction angle. Um, so, and based on these uh, these three uh, factors, they created a, a, a scoring system, and they found like patients who had no risk factors, none of them developed uh, osteoporosis. Oh, sorry, uh, proximal junction failure. Patients even with single risk factor, one of these three risk factors, approximately half of them, 50% of them developed a uh, uh, PJF. And if they had two risk factors, they developed uh, around 60 to 70% of patients developed uh, PJF. And if patients have all three risk factors, almost 100% developed uh, proximal junction failure over the follow-up. Um, uh, in terms of clinical outcomes, uh, they found difference uh, in all the parameters, including ODI, SRS, uh, at all uh, follow-up. Um, um, and they were significantly different among the cohort. So definitely had significant impact on uh, quality of life uh, uh, measures. So in conclusions, authors uh, uh, mentioned that age greater than 70 years, osteoporosis and proximal junction angle more than zero degree were identified as significant risk factors. However, TJL can be considered as UIV uh, and selectively for patients who are younger without osteoporosis and with lordotic preoperative proximal junction angle. Um, there were, third, there were a lot of limitations of this study. First of all, it's a retrospective uh, a study from a single institution. So generalizability uh, is, is an issue. Um, second, uh, there is always a, a risk with selection bias and uh, uh, surgical techniques, surgeon experience. Uh, as the study spans over a long period of time from 2005 to 16, so there is variability in uh, surgical techniques as well as the small sample size cannot be under, underestimated. Uh, definition of PJF did not include myelopathy and spondylolisthesis at the proximal level. And uh, authors did not consider the use of uh, other uh, measures like muscleine tape or sublaminar band as proximal semi-rigid fixation. And uh, regarding the follow-up, uh, uh, authors mentioned at least a minimum follow-up follow -up of two years. However, uh, their average follow-up was uh, 56 months plus minus 30, 33 months, which fall under the less than two years category. So uh, that was not very clear. So um, how generalizable is the study? Um, that's a question. However, it's an interesting addition to the literature. I will open it for the questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, th this uh, obviously is a topic that has been uh, visited in numerous papers over the years, but I think with, with some of these issues that are not totally resolved, each new paper that comes out is worth uh, looking at and, and discussing. It does obviously have the weakness of being a, a single institution ret retrospective study, but um, uh, you know, it, it does certainly uh, <clears throat> suggest that um, and once again, if, if you uh, believe all the conclusions, um, uh, despite the weaknesses that are, um, you know, going to T10 uh, may not be necessary in all cases. And it's certainly worth uh, replicating other studies. Uh, I'll be interested to know uh, the, the opinions of the deformity surgeons uh, on, on board. It's important to also realize that it, it did not address whether stopping at L1 is better than stopping at T10. It's just saying, saying that if you decide to stop at L1, uh, what are some of the factors that may uh, cause it to fail? And uh, it, it comes up with th those three factors. So with that, I would open it up to questions, in particular, Jens and Mark uh, the Tos Toski, I would like to know, uh, do you do go to T10 in all these cases? Uh, what, or do you go above T10? And uh, when would you consider, if not, when would you consider stopping at L1? Again, a well-chosen article. Thank you, uh, uh, Team Louisville, for this. Um, this is a really um, important topic. And again, uh, the answer eludes us. And uh, Dr. Boachi has correctly pointed out that there's been controversial uh, statements in the literature. So I think all of the statements uh, made by the authors are intuitively and clinically applicable. Um, let me ask a question first. So was there a critical cutoff a value given for a T-score that we as clinicians can use or a Hounsfield units on CT sampling? Is there anything like that available? Um, so they just, um, I'm sorry, uh, they just mentioned patient with osteoporosis. They did not mention the Z-score specifically in the article. Yeah, so th this is one of those things that um, I, I want to point out. Uh, again, we would like to have some a little bit more definition because as we all know, osteopenia slash osteoporosis are indistinctly used terms frequently and um, having a little bit more guidance in that regard is a big deal. 
Uh, so where to stop is, is a big deal because we obviously hope that the rib cage will provide us some support. And I think most of us are very loath to stop at the thoracolumbar junction because there's clearly more mobility and less rotational restriction as imparted by the rib cage. Um, without increasing the morbidity of the patients too much, I best estimates about half an hour, maybe an hour extra surgery time, nothing trivial, but nothing horrendous either. Uh, I think most of us in uh, aging patients now very clearly advocate for the lower thoracic spine. Again, the devil is in the detail in these kinds of papers. Why am I saying that? For instance, there's a lot of patients who have uh, dish-like spines where there's a significant ossification around the disc spaces and that secondarily stabilizes the spine. So in a patient like that, you can get away with a shorter instrumentation because you have a biologic buffer more or less, if you so will. Um, again, like Mark pointed out before, the devil's in the detail. How do you uh, kind of uh, uh, deal with the adjacent segments? Are you denovating everything and bovying everything into oblivion? Or do you preserve the soft tissues? And that includes the facet joint nerves at the uppermost level uh, carefully and judiciously. So those are, those are really um, uh, big, uh, big factors. One thing that uh, my rehab colleagues have really pointed out is what they call the posterior chain activation. That means the extensor muscles from their shoulder girdle down to their buttocks. And patients who have a good activation of their muscles tend to probably have far less collapse than those patients, and those are my worst nightmare, who just hang forwards. And any fusion that you stop anywhere will be put to an ultimate test at this junction zone because of this hanging forwards. The patients literally hang in their instrumentation. So that for me is one of those little difficult points to kind of pick out in a scientific paper because I don't know how to express that, but clinically, that's a major worry for me. Sorry for my verbose response, but I thank you so much for bringing that up. So Maxwell, uh, let's say you have a 65-year-old relatively healthy guy has an ugly degenerative scoliosis uh, and you think you can rebalance that individual uh, up to L1, would you stop at L1 or would you, in a 65-year-old guy, cross the thoracolumbar junction automatically? And if so, why? I, I, I would uh, look at the, the bone quality. Let's say it's, uh, it's a 65-year-old with young bone, no significant osteoporosis. Uh, I would consider, <laughs> consider stopping at L1 uh, but, you know, uh, I think we really need to think, uh, collect more information on, on this. I think the knee-jerk reaction of going to T10 on every one uh, may not, we may be over-treating some of these. Uh, so if they have bone, bo good bone quality, they, they are, um, uh, and they are, don't, don't have too many medical comorbidities, and um, I'm just doing like L1 to S1, I may just stop at L1. You know, I think there, there was, uh, I saw a talk by, um, was it Lenke or recently that have also begun looking at stopping at L1 in some of these situations. So, um, you know, if you asked me two years ago, I would probably have gone to T10 automatically, but now and I think I'm revisiting about considering stopping at L1 in some of these cases. Obviously, I don't have the perfect answer. You know, I think we need more data and more understanding of this. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mina Thadi Kunta. I'm one of the uh, neurosurgery residents, PGY6, here at U of L. Um, I wanted to thank the Seattle Science Foundation for extending the invitation to our um, department. It's really nice to connect with you all. Um, the article that I'll be presenting today is Enhanced Recovery Implementation and Perioperative Outcomes in Posterior Fusion Patients. Um, this is an article written by Fiascanero et al. Um, in Spine Surgery and was published in 2020. A little bit of background on the concept of ARIS. Um, I understand this is a um, topic that you all covered at a previous journal club. Um, so not to uh, speak on deaf ears uh, for people that already know, um, but ARIS is a concept that's gained a lot of traction within the surgical literature, um, particularly within neurosurgery. 
and then within the subspecialty of the spine. Uh, the aim of these protocols is basically to improve the quality regarding perioperative management of spine patients. Um, and so the end outcome of these protocols is to improve patient outcomes, complication rates, length of stay, and hospital cost. The existing literature on ARIS protocols within neurosurgery and specifically spine surgery are limited to single institutions um, with generally a small N. Um, and so it begs to question um, whether we have true evidence basis for some of these protocols. Um, what is the ultimate impact of them and are they generalizable um, to other institutions? Um, the components of the ARIS protocol that were covered in this particular study um, were a few things. So use of multimodal anesthesia, use of TXA, post-op day zero use of anti-emetics, post-op day zero use of steroids, post-op day zero or post-op day one um, use of physical therapy, avoidance of a Foley, avoidance of a PCA, and avoidance of surgical drains. I think we skipped a slide here. Um, I'm going to go back to the ultimate study design. Um, so the impetus for this study was to create a large study. Um, and so we could really identify the evidence behind some of these protocols. Um, so the aim was to analyze the association between ARIS protocol implementation, complication rates, length of stay and hospital stay cost. Um, the population was taken from a database called Premier Healthcare Database, um, and they selected for patients that underwent a posterior lumbar fusion from 2006 to 2016. Um, and then this yielded a study population of 265,576 patients, so a fairly large uh, cohort. Um, the independent variable was the level of ARIS implementation um, that we utilized at each of these cases. Um, so I want to emphasize that these were man-made artificial constructs um, as a part of this study, these categories of low, medium, or high. Um, and so if a particular patient had three of those previous qualities that I had mentioned, that was considered low, between three and five was considered medium, and above five um, was considered high. Um, and so going back to um, what was included in that their ARIS um, implementation protocols um, are these eight things. Um, and so three of those would have been low, between three and five would have been medium, and above five would have been high. Um, the primary outcome of this study was any complication overall. Um, secondarily, they looked at cardiopulmonary complications, length of stay, and cost of hospitalization. Um, other variables of interest that they looked at um, are listed here. Um, basically, you know, demographic variables and any potential confounders um, that would influence the results. Um, so these were accounted for in some of their uh, mixed models and statistical analyses. Um, in terms of their statistical analyses, so they use standardized differences in lieu of traditional p-values, and they considered a value of greater than 0.1 as a significant value. Um, and then in order to determine some of the individual effects of this protocol, um, they used a mixed effects model um, to associate the significance with the outcome. Um, and they used a p-value of 0 0.006 due to the number of variables involved. Um, in terms of the results, so um, the breakdown for low, medium, and high um, was fairly varied. So low implementation was about 24%. Um, the median category was 62.8%, so that was the most highly utilized um, category. And then high was 13.3%. In terms of the outcome, so they had a 7.2% rate of any complication and a 1.67 rate of cardiopulmonary complication. This is a nice table that um, shows that more and more institutions are using uh, more components of ARIS with time. Um, and so most institutions have a medium level of implementation, um, but there is a rise of high levels of ARIS implementation and then a decline in levels of low um, ARIS implementation. Um, within the high ARIS group, they attempted to identify um, factors that were a throughput uh, representative of that group. Um, so Caucasian race um, had a standardized ratio of 0.16. The small hospital size um, had a standardized ratio of 0.19. Higher provider volume was 0.34 and lower opioid usage was 0.13.
sorry, uh, trying to advance the slide here. Um, Ashley, are you able to advance the slide for me by chance? There we go. Thank you. Um, we could just go back to the first table. There's one before that. Thank you. Um, so they looked at um, these individual factors um, uh, in terms of their outcomes between um, medium levels of errors implementation versus low, and that's listed on the left side. Um, and then they also compared high levels of um, errors implementation with low, and that's listed on the right side. Um, you can see in terms of every single outcome that they looked at, um, medium and high levels of errors implementation were associated with a statistical difference between low. Um, so this was um, a, a very big kind of finding for their study. Um, on the next slide is the mixed um, model uh, regression that they had created. Um, so the attempt here is to ind individualize the effects themselves um, rather than grouping these together um, and determine which um, variables may have been the most suggestive of changes in terms of outcomes. Um, this is a little bit of a busy table. Um, overall, I would say that most of the variables were associated with some difference in terms of the outcomes, um, particularly for any complication. Um, the patterns that I'd like to highlight are um, use of multimodal anesthesia and the use of TXA um, actually increased costs, um, and that was found to be statistically significant. Um, so that's listed over on the right uh, top hand corner. Um, in terms of the things that were most beneficial, um, so use of physical therapy on day zero um, or day one um, was particularly beneficial for all of the outcomes. And then in addition to that, use of steroids on day zero um, was also found to be very beneficial across all of their outcomes. Um, the last thing that I wanted to highlight on this table is that the um, avoidance of surgical drains um, was helpful for reducing hospital uh, length of stay as well. Um, this is an article that was published by our department. Um, so the first author here is Dr. Dietz, who's actually our intern, um, and then corresponding author was Dr. Boyachi. Um, so this was a, um, a meta-analysis of the existing literature on errors protocols for spine surgery. Um, the reason that I like this article is that, you know, it attempts to put together all of the existing literature and really define what is evidence-based um, in terms of these errors protocols. Um, I highlighted this table um, because it highlights um, some other um, things that we can think about that could be implemented in ARIS protocols that don't necessarily need to be limited to the eight things that were included in this particular study. Um, and so this is a, a field that um, needs creative minds um, in order to think about ways that we can implement um, uh, surgical quality and improvement within the field. And so thinking about the different things that we can do pre-operatively, intraoperatively, and post-operatively is important um, and continues to, be, to evolve. Um, in terms of the conclusions of this paper, um, so adherence to this ARIS protocol um, appeared to be associated with a lower morbidity, lower length of stay, and decreased cost, with the exception of the use of TXA and multimodal anesthesia. Um, I think the pro of the study is that it's a large retrospective study with a nearly complete data set. Um, I thought that was fairly impressive um, to have a nearly complete data set, especially with an N of about 25,000. The con of the study is that um, the primary independent variables um, were largely man-made constructs of, you know, implementation of three of these components versus five of these components um, with not a lot of um, homogeneity amongst the groups. Um, so there's a large variation there and it can be hard to really um, ascertain whether there was a true effect from a certain component. Um, they did try to account for this by doing the mixed model um, statistical analyses. Um, but again, in terms of um, what, are, what data is actually evidence-based, it's hard to say. Um, this is a retrospective review, and so trying to figure out the intent of um, some of the clinicians that were involved in the management of these patients is hard to ascertain in a retrospective review. Um, as an example, someone that may have received steroids on post-op day zero, it may have been because of airway edema rather than some kind of intent to uh, recover the patient faster and get them out of the hospital faster. Um, 
In terms of other criticisms for this paper, um, so some of the errors components that they included, some clinicians may feel that those are extremely important and um, do work towards improving quality overall. Um, other clinicians may feel that, you know, this is maybe myopic or some of those um, components are not important and not something that they would recommend doing for um, improvement of quality. Uh, the take-home message overall is that ERAS protocols do work to improve quality in spine surgery, um, but as a field require more rigorous study to become uh, evidence-based um, before implementation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks Mina for a great presentation. Uh, definitely a, a timely study because we live in a world of value-based uh, as a care. And so it's important to demonstrate value and this definitely is something that can be used to uh, improve the value of spine surgery in terms of the bundled payments. Uh, this may be a way to reduce the length of stays and things like that. There's obviously limitations. You mentioned all of that being a database study. Uh, it's not clear the, uh, the whether from a database you can determine why steroids or other things were given. Was it specifically for the uh, ERS protocol? So there are some limitations, but overall, this is sort of like a new approach to uh, trying to study ERS and demonstrating value. The other limitation is the lack of patient reported outcomes. Uh, so we don't really know whether what they did influenced six month or one year patient reported outcomes. But let me open it up to uh, questions uh, and, and see if there are other uh, opinions. So Mina, uh, I actually really appreciated you talking about ERS again and follow up from uh, last week's presentation because this opens up a couple of different angles. Um, we do use and participate in Premier and it's a very interesting massive database and uh, the obvious limitations apply but uh, the, the fascinating and the scary thing alike is the amount of data is uh, dramatic and um, Trying to make sense of it is uh, challenging. Uh, just as a question, uh, do you participate in, in that, Dr. Boachi? Uh, uh, no, um, we do not participate in Premier. Yeah, we've used it as a benchmark uh, uh, to kind of look at our internal quality data and have a large external quality uh, review process. So I, it's super expensive, but we found that as we looked at num a number of uh, uh, um, organizations that provide kind of benchmarking. Premier was uh, right up there and they've just recently opened up for academic investigations. So uh, we're doing one or two projects with them right now. So we found them to be very responsive and um, very interested in having clinician input, which I found delightful. But it's, it's definitely a, a, a new door opening up for ERAS. So the, my thoughts about ERAS, um, reflected last week, but this paper goes a couple of steps beyond that. For me, what it really shows is that an institution is dedicated not just for quality uh, control, which everybody claims they have, but process control. And so this is about process control on a larger scale. And um, there are many, many statements made or uh, observations made that are probably more associations than causation, but uh, nonetheless, um, uh, it's certainly always interesting to see what kind of bleeps up. So you raised the issue of steroids perioperatively, you raised the issue of Foley catheterization, TXA. And again, um, those, are, those are all very interesting uh, factors. Um, let me turn that around to you then. Um, in your own practice, Mina, uh, would you change anything that you do? Let's say you have a two level fusion that you're gonna do on a uh, male past 60, uh, would you give that patient no Foley based on this? Would you uh, advocate for giving him 10 milligrams of Decadron at induction? Uh, wh what are the actual practical insights that you gained from this? Yeah, I think that this um, is a great question. You know, at any time that you read a study, you want to think about whether this is going to change your own practice. Um, so, you know, in terms of what I would do differently, um, I think I would think about some of the anesthesia considerations that were made in this paper that seemed to be a good through line um, in terms of the data. Um, I would think about TXA um, for sure, and I would think about the surgical drains. Those were the um, strongest pieces of data um, that I saw. In terms of um, steroids, I think that's a very controversial subject within the spine literature in general. Um, steroids is also known to be associated with postoperative complications. It may not 
not have been caught by the study, including postoperative pneumonia, difficulty weaning from a ventilator, um, and wound infections. Um, certainly, I've um, been burned by uh, uh, intraoperative steroids um, uh, with some of our patients with postoperative complications. Um, and so, I personally am not a, a huge fan of um, steroids in general. Um, but I think that there are other components of this um, era study um, that may be interesting to apply to our patient population. Well said. So uh, we have to close. Maxwell, do you want to take us out of here with a final statement on ERAS? Are you guys practicing it? Where do we go from here? Uh, we are uh, practicing. It's, it's more advanced than some of the, our other uh, subspecialties, but uh, we, we are getting to it. I think it's unavoidable. It's, it's the future of spine surgery, and we all have to uh, think of value. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Jens and the, um, Ashley and the Seattle uh, Science Foundation uh, for uh, this platform that allowed us to go over these interesting articles. Um, I thank our outstanding residents and fellows, including Nikhil Jane, who will be looking for a job in the near future. So uh, if you have any, let him know. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all your comments, Jens, and look forward to future presentations. Thank you, Team Louisville. You guys did an outstanding job. Have a great weekend and uh, really good to see you all. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.